Ordo Historia, Volume 1, Eden, from negative 22,000 year Pythagoras until negative 6,000 year Pythagoras. Book 1, Atlantis, from negative 22,000 year Pythagoras until negative 12,000 year Pythagoras. Prelude, the beginning, prior to negative 22,000 year Pythagoras. Before the time of gods, and long before the time of men, there was the time when consciousness first came to earth, and we call this time the beginning. Now at this time, earth was repaired from the asteroid that had struck it and killed the dinosaurs. This terrible event had created the Atlantic Ocean and divided Pangaea into Eurasia on the east and Laurasia on the west. But Gondwana had not yet been divided into India and Antarctica, nor Atlantica into South America and Africa. The positive North Pole was above Chimeria, opposite where the cataclysmic asteroid had struck, which had become the negative South Pole when the asteroid split Pangaea in two between the Pacific and Tethys Oceans. Mammals flourished in the positive North Polar region with little competition from the avian dinosaurs in Atlantica which had already long ago begun to die out as a result of the asteroid collision. When the asteroid had struck Earth at the end of the Mesozoic reptile dominated era and the beginning of the ongoing Cenozoic mammal dominated era, it had brought with it what the Neanderthals of Sumeria had once called the seed of life, that is, self-awareness. The presence of its fixed EM polar field led to what was later termed ME, or mental energy. The avian dinosaurs were migrating away from this impact toward the opposite, cooler side of the Earth, while the mammals from the opposite side of the Earth were migrating towards the impact crater, seeking its volcanic warmth. As these mammals migrated from the Deccan's traps, the furthest point on Earth away from where the asteroid hit, they journeyed first across the Horn of Atlantica, then through northern Laurasia into southern Eurasia, finally settling in the archipelago we call today the Yucatan, comprised of the last remnants above sea level of what were once the central Pangean mountain range between the Pantalassic Ocean in the north and the Paleotethys Ocean in the south. The asteroid had split Pangaea into Laurasia and Eurasia. Laurasia had divided into Gondwana and Atlantica. The mammals, our ancestors, spread from then negative south polar Gondwana land through subtropical Atlantica towards the place of the asteroid impact that had split Eurasia from Laurasia and severed Pangaea then at the positive north pole. By the time they reached the Yucatan archipelago they had acquired sentience due to the strong stable EM field over the location where the asteroid had hit in the modern-day Bermuda Triangle. Once Atlantica had split from Gondwana and northern South America joined with South Eurasia, these earliest sentient mammals were just beginning to evolve higher reasoning. 
By then, the EM poles of the planet had reversed, and the prior positive North Pole had become the negative South Pole, and what would become North America and Greenland, which had recently split from Eurasia, were beginning to be covered in glaciers. This necessitated the now southern sentient mammals in the Yucatan moving towards the now northern pole where they had originated in Zealandia. Chapter 1 The First Recorded Aeon of the P.O.D.'s History From negative 22,000 year Pythagoras until negative 20,000 year Pythagoras. Our story begins as these southern sentient mammals migrating northward finally reached Australia by journeying to the southernmost region of South America where a narrow land bridge yet connected South America to Gondwana. At this time, South America and Gondwana were tropical, the equator running roughly parallel with a mid-Atlantic trench. The negative South Pole in the modern Yucatan and the positive North Pole in modern India, then still connected to Antarctica, Australia, and Madagascar. The Bimini Road was built by the first proto-hominids, Artipithecus, when the region was a tropical rainforest. When they began to migrate north, this bipedal tree-dweller, precursor of both the great ape pan-gorillas and the earliest hominid predecessors of men, split into two species, the Ramidus of South America and the Kadaba of Africa. By negative 22,000 year Pythagoras, the A. Kadaba had migrated into subtropical Africa. However, the A. Ramadus had reached both equatorial Africa and South America, and from South America were able to enter the northern regions of Gondwana, then near the positive North Pole. While the A. Kadaba species appears to have subsequently evolved into the calf ape, the dog-faced genus of great ape, by staying in tropical Africa, the cooler climates of northern Gondwana allowed the earliest bipeds to evolve into two new species of proto-hominid, Australopithecus and Paranthropus. When the Australopithecines entered northern Gondwana, they also left behind the earliest Nazca lines near Peru in southernmost South America. These earliest lines were simple, straight lines extending for hundreds of miles and show the same precision of measurement using horizon line engineering and or aerial cartography used by the Artipithecus who built the Bimini Road. Obviously, the reversal of the EM poles that had begun the North American glaciation had also reduced their level of Masonic technology. However, we cannot say at this time what wonders the Australopithecines may have erected in Antarctica, now buried by glaciers. What we can say is that by the time of the beginning of the POD's records of history, negative 22,000 year Pythagoras, the Bimini Road was already ancient the Yucatan Pole mostly abandoned already, and the majority of the Australopithecine pre-humans were living near the positive North Pole in North Gondwana and the Zealand Archipelago. Therefore, 
the historical records of our order describing the times of the Yucatan North Pole derive from this time, by which the Yucatan was already the negative South Pole, and much of the North American continent already glaciated. These records describe the Ardipithecus, who built the Bimini Road, and the Australopithecines, who carved the earliest Nazca lines. During this time, from negative 22,000 year Pythagoras until negative 20,000 year Pythagoras, the first aeon of our order's historical records, the Peruvian and Gondwanan Australopithecines recorded the history thus far given. Their own laws, however, remain unknown. They record only the story of the Ardipithecus, but do not leave behind any account of their own. Therefore, this period we know of none to have reigned, and so we designate this the Aeon of the Unknown Law. The Australopithecines of this era, we know, lived throughout the equatorial regions of Africa and South America, between the glaciated negative south polar region of the Yucatan and the non-glaciated positive north polar region of Guandwana. The exact location of the negative south pole was above the Bimini Road, and so the mythology of the earliest Australopithecines associates the Bimini Road with the still recent EM polar reversal, as well as with the asteroid to have struck the Bermuda Triangle and killed the dinosaurs. It was widely believed the Bimini Road ended exactly at the contemporary location of the negative South Pole, and had been built by the Ardipithecus before the pole had reversed. Thus, they reasoned, the EM poles had reversed, however the Earth's crust had not shifted. This, they attributed to the Bimini Road's location as a road mark pointing the exact location of the EM pole that reversed positive to negative, and by this they reasoned their origins were in a migration route perpetually following south to north. To commemorate the significance of the Bimini Road in their mythology, the earliest Australopithecines constructed the earliest Nazca lines as roads pointing off in the directions of all their great cities in that then equatorial region. However, we know now what they knew not then, that it was not the Bimini Road itself whose building had triggered the EM pole reversal. It was due to a peculiar occasional reversal of the EM poles of the asteroid to have struck the Bermuda Triangle, caused by the resetting of the Sun's EM field. The Sun's EM poles reversed, and this triggered the EM poles of the asteroid to reverse and thus the EM poles of the Earth were reversed. The Australopithecines of Gondwana recorded the exact location of the negative south pole by the Bimini Road in their time, but they did not yet understand that it was not the Bimini Road itself that caused the Earth's last EM pole reversal. It was due to this earliest misunderstanding that so much fatal misinformation has been passed on regarding Earth's EM pole reversal's natural causes. The Bimini Road had prevented crust shift. However, the primitive and de-evolved Australopithecines recorded their Ardipithecus antecedents, more advanced Masonic technology, as the cause for the EM pole shift and forgot it had prevented crust shift from occurring as well. Chapter 2 The Second Aeon From negative 20,000 year Pythagoras until negative 18,000 year Pythagoras Now, 
By the end of the earliest aeon of Australopithecine habitation of Gondwana, the entire history of their ancestors had been enshrined in much the same terms as our mythology remains to this day, recording a story of an ancient fall of mankind from a height in the previous positive North Pole region of the Bimini Road to a depth in the new positive North Pole region of Gondwana, which had previously been in the south. Their predecessors, they recorded, as having grown too learned in their technology, and so brought about their own downfall by building the Bimini Road and causing the EM pole reversal, a point of view we now understand to be incorrect. By the time of the second aeon to be recorded by the historians of the era that has survived to be passed down to us in the order of death, the Australopithecines of Gondwana had begun to become nearly as technologically advanced as their Ardipithecus ancestors. They recorded the movement of the negative South Pole as it precessed along the Bimini Road, and they predicted its future location as the Bermuda Triangle, directly above the location of the asteroid to have hit Earth and killed the dinosaurs. The Australopithecines had an extensive record of the history of their own earliest ancestors, the builders of the first Nazca lines, and they had some elder myths describing their prior species, the Ardipithecus. Their myths recorded the building of the Bimini Road, but misinterpreted its function as a weapon which was used by the A. Ramadis to destroy and disperse the A. Kadaba, but which backfired and caused the E. M. pole reversal that began the glaciation of North America and Greenland and Eurasia. As the second aeon began, some of the Australopithecines who lived near the negative south polar region observed the precession of the E. M. pole along the Bimini Road and began to reinterpret the myths about the purpose for which the Ardipithecus had built it. These southern Australopithecines predicted another negative over positive EM pole reversal would follow the negative south EM pole's precession along the Bimini Road between the Bermuda Triangle and the Yucatan which, once the negative south pole reached the far end of the Bimini Road, would result in a violent crust shift. They could not, however, predict when this would occur because, although they were aware the position of the EM pole was processing along the Bimini Road, they could not measure at exactly what rate it was moving, since it appeared to them to be moving at an accelerating rate as the negative south EM pole continued to process the course of the Bimini Road across the Bermuda Triangle toward the Yucatan, the new information about the old myth began to spread toward the Australopithecine inhabitants of Gondwana near the positive North Pole. Hearing the predictions of the imminent EM pole reversal, the positive North dwellers realized that a mass migration toward the present negative South Pole would have to be prepared prior to the event, but that, if a crust shift occurred concurrent to the EM pole reversal, as was being predicted, they would not know where on the Earth's surface to migrate the people to, because they could not be sure of the potential effects of a crust shift, and what areas would be affected, and how. The people of the positive north quickly realized that, because they could not suppress the findings of the people of the negative south regarding the mythology of the earth's poles, they would have to destroy the current people of the negative south in order to make room for the people then living in the positive north to inhabit the lands of the negative south. 
so Gondwana's Australopithecines began to form a stricter, more militant notion of government, and eventually, by the end of the second aeon of our history, they invaded the people of northern South America near the Yucatan negative South Pole. Because this era marked the beginning of modern astronomy as a means of measuring the movement of the EM pole as it processed along the Bimini Road, we call this aeon the Law of Heaven. At this period, the cycle of aeons began to be recorded, although the subsequent Law of Twelve Star Signs, 2,000 years long each, had not yet begun to be implemented as a means of measuring polar precession. The 23.5 degree angle tilt of the Earth was still relatively close to its present configuration. However, the crust of the Earth was still oriented at a more or less right angle to its present orientation to our EM pole. In other words, at this time, negative 20,000 year Pythagoras, the angle of inclination of Earth was the same. However, the crust was such that the EM negative south pole was in the Bermuda Triangle region and the positive north pole in the region of Zealand, which would later break apart into India, New Zealand, Australia, Antarctica, and Madagascar. The Australopithecines of the positive north in Gondwana eventually went to war against the Australopithecines of the negative south near the Yucatan. Their battleground was the equatorial regions of Africa and southern South America, site of their earlier ancestors' constructions of the first Nazca lines. The primary casualties of this war were the Paranthropists who inhabited the equatorial region. The result was that the Paranthropists eventually died out and became extinct in the equatorial regions. The positive north Gondwana Australopithecines pushed south and eventually drove the Paranthropus into the colder regions of negative south Eurasia, a region whose colder climate the equatorial Paranthropus could not survive in. As the Australopithecines of the positive north Gondwana migrated south across the equator to begin to actually threaten the Australopithecines of the negative south in South America, and seeing the influx of immigre equatorial paranthropus, the Australopithecines of the negative south moved further south as well, until they were occupying the Yucatan archipelago itself. The very lands they had predicted would be the site of the subsequent EM pole reversal and crust shift. The Australopithecines of the extreme negative south were reduced in numbers and surrounded. At the location of their predicted EM pole reversal, site of the most likely largest displacement by crust shift in the southernmost Yucatan Islands, the negative south Australopithecines took shelter. The positive north Australopithecines had gathered a wave of terrified Paranthropus before them, and they closed in from all sides. Chapter 3 The Third Aeon From negative 18,000 year Pythagoras until negative 16,000 year Pythagoras. As the third aeon of our order's history dawned, the world was in the midst of a terrible and cataclysmic war between the Australopithecine species of proto-hominid in the positive north from Gondwana and the Australopithecine and Paranthropus species in the negative south. The war began because the negative south Australopithecines had discovered that the negative south EM pole was processing along the Bimini Road across the Bermuda Triangle toward the Yucatan where the asteroid hit that had killed the dinosaurs and fractured Pangaea into Laurasia and Eurasia. The site of this asteroid, the negative south Australopithecines understood, 
had once been the positive North EM pole, and they believed the EM pole would reverse again when the EM pole overlapped with the site of the asteroid impact and bring with it this time a massive crust shift as well. Finally, the positive North Australopithecines had forced the negative South Australopithecines and the equatorial Paranthropus into the Yucatan itself in the most negative South Polar region. The location of the negative South Australopithecines prediction for the location of the next cataclysmic EM pole reversal. So the third aeon of our order dawned, and negative 18,000 year Pythagoras began with a terrible siege by the positive North Australopithecines against their brethren and the equatorial Paranthropus in the negative South in the Yucatan Islands. At the same time, the negative South Pole moved into the same location in the Yucatan at the end of the Bimini Road across the Bermuda Triangle above the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs. When the negative South EM pole aligned with the fixed EM polarity of the asteroid, there was indeed a cataclysm. Above the Yucatan there was a terrible upheaval of a rarefied earth element which the Greeks called orocalc the Atlanteans Rho, comprised of the fixed polarity particles of alloyed metals and minerals from inside the asteroid beneath the Bermuda Triangle. Namely, when the negative south EM pole aligned with the asteroid, that essence of existence, the mental energy, the origin of consciousness, was extracted from inside the asteroid. The Yucatan region and most of its inhabitants were destroyed in a great flash as the rare earth element, called modernly monoatomic platinum, shook loose from the earth in a massive uprising pillar of luminous dust, for this particular element emits light. On the opposite side of earth, in the now more or less abandoned positive north polar region, a sudden shift occurred in the atmosphere, and a rip in the ionosphere above the upper stratosphere began to form. This swirling gap was formed because when, on the negative south polar side of Earth, the EM pole had aligned with the EM field of the asteroid, thus causing the eruption of antimony metals into the atmosphere. It created a pull on the opposite side of Earth, above the positive North Pole, in the ionosphere above the upper stratosphere. When the metals were lifted up from the Earth, the Earth's entire EM field became saturated with the superconductive metals, and on the side furthest from the explosion, a rip in the ionosphere began forming. The result of the rift, caused by the expulsion, on the far side of the planet, quickly drew the monoatomic dust cloud toward it to patch the leak through which oxygen was escaping, forming plasma clouds similar in appearance to the aurora borealis. So nearly as soon as the negative south EM pole aligned with the asteroid over the Yucatan, the essence of superconductive gold brought to Earth by the asteroid was entirely removed from that area and transposed to the opposite EM pole, the positive North Pole. Just as the result of this was deadly to those in the Yucatan negative South region, it was a miracle to those who remained in Gondwana in the positive North region. Inexplicably to them, the sky above Gondwana lit up very brightly one day. At that time, negative 18,000 year Pythagoras, there were few people left living in the regions of positive North Gondwana land, as the majority of the Australopithecines had migrated south to fight the negative South Australopithecines and the Paranthropus. Gradually, word began to come back from the negative South 
about the cataclysmic plume of mysterious glowing white powder, and soon the Gondwana Australopithecines began to wonder greatly at the light they had seen in the sky. Eventually, it was reckoned that everyone in the negative south hemisphere had died. Those who had survived were recalled to the positive north. A new government was taking shape in Gondwana, based on a kingship established by a marriage between a general from the positive north and a princess from the negative south. They named their positive north hemisphere empire Nibiru. They directed the first planning sessions for the Order's migrational movements, which continue to this day. They directed that the area between the Yucatan and the Yukon Bay, where the negative South Pole was at that time, be strictly avoided from migration routes. From South America, Australopithecines were encouraged to migrate south into Africa. Those in Africa encouraged to migrate east into Eurasia. Those in eastern Eurasia to migrate northwest to South America, etc. The first king and queen established their throne at the positive north EM pole in the same location as the negative south EM pole at present in the center of modern Antarctica. And they established the way in via the Indian subcontinent island and the way out via Australia, but the way via the South American land bridge connecting to Antarctica, they sealed off so that none could cross there to reach the one continent from the other. During the wars in the negative south, the geography of Gondwana and the positive north had become broken up into the independent islands of Antarctica, Australia, New Zealand, India, and Madagascar. It was from the throne city in modern Antarctica that the king and queen reigned. They called their capital city Agade. Their names were An and Antu, and their name for the constellation of islands formerly forming Gondwana was Nibiru. They recorded the legends of the North-South War as occurring between the Children of Light in the Positive North and the Children of Darkness in the Negative South. So in the Negative North Pole of Earth, on the continent called Antarctica, from former Gondwana, was the Empire of Nibiru established. They recorded the breaking apart of Atlantica to form Africa and South America as the war in heaven between their own continent, Gondwana, which they called Nibiru, and Atlantica, which they called Tiamat. Tiamat, they explained, broke apart to form Ki, that is, Africa, and Kingyu, that is, South America. North America, they spoke of only as the white lands to the south, for seven generations, the heirs of Anne and Antu reigned over Nibiru in modern Antarctica. Finally, in the seventh generation, a deposed rebel king named Alalu fled to Ki. It is described how he passed the six islands of former Gondwana. Madagascar, he called Gaga. India, he called Anshar. New Zealand, he called Kishar. Australia, he called Antu. Antarctica, he called An. So Alalu fled to the Forbidden South and entered the realms of the Forbidden Arctic Circle, which then occupied the Hudson Bay area. The story of his descent from Nibiru is recorded in the Book of Enki, as recently as negative 6,000 year Pythagoras. Alalu ventured toward the pole southward, across the Horn of Africa, 
following the same migration route of the greatly more ancient Artipithecus. However, before even reaching the distant pole, Alalu found something far more precious. It is written in the Book of Enki, who was the son of Anu, Alalu's rival, that Alalu left Nibiru and journeyed to Ki in search of the monoatomic element's source in order to seal the hole in the atmosphere above the Nibiru and capital Agate in Antarctica. The breach had caused the monoatomic element to descend to Earth and permeate the ground, and it was believed that, by mining it from volcanoes, the warmth in Nibiru which was freezing its crops could be restored. This may or may not have been the motive for Alalu's flight toward the forbidden inner regions of the Apsu, beyond the hammered bracelet of the Strait of Gibraltar. What Alalu, the northern Antarctican Australopithecine, discovered in the regions of equatorial Africa was that there had been survivors in the southern hemisphere. The catastrophic alignment of Earth's negative south EM pole with the asteroid buried beneath the Yucatan had indeed drastically reduced the population there, Alalu discovered, and this had forced the southern Australopithecines to interbreed with the equatorial Paranthropus. The new species the Australopithecine Alalu discovered was the Cro-Magnon. The news of Alalu's discovery reached Anu, his rival, king in Nibiru. Alalu had sent word he'd found gold to heal Nibiru's atmosphere. In fact, he had discovered no such thing. Instead, he'd learned from the relatively more primitive Cro-Magnon's tribal myths that the rift above Nibiru was caused by the alignment of the negative south EM pole aligning with the asteroid in the Bermuda Triangle that had killed the dinosaurs. The rift was unnaturally caused. The cooling period of Nibiru, the kingdom to the far north, was natural. Therefore, Alalu realized, the rift was not responsible for the cooling. However, to trick the Nibiruans, to send other Australopithecines to him, to interbreed with the Cro-Magnons, Alalu plotted. The message was returned to Alalu from Anu in Agade on Nibiru. Anunnaki, those Australopithecines who, from Nibiru to Ki, came by ships, were sent immediately to join Alalu in North Africa. Chapter 4 The Fourth Aeon From negative 1600, year Pythagoras, until negative 1400, year Pythagoras. At the beginning of the fourth aeon, recorded by our order historians, Nibiru in Antarctica ruled the empire of Oceania the islands formerly comprising the landmass of Gondwana. It is unclear if the events leading up to the breaking apart of Gondwana were the same events as those leading up to the tear in the ionosphere above Agade, the capital of Nibiru. It appears likely that Gondwana had begun to break apart, and the positive North Hemisphere Australopithecines had begun to migrate south toward the Yucatan many millennia before the beginning of our order's records of these events, and that the cataclysmic gold dust cloud over the Yucatan, which eventually settled over Antarctica, was caused by the negative south EM pole aligning in around negative 18,000 year Pythagoras, with the asteroid that had crashed there previously at the time of the extinction of the dinosaurs epochs prior. However, aside from relating this mysterious and historically unrecorded dust cloud, 
to the rift in the ionosphere above Antarctica that began at the same time, recorded in the annals of Nibiru. There is little more we can say about the times before the Antarctic and Australopithecines, summoned there by Alalu, a deposed king from among them, entered the region of northeast Africa, between the Sinai Peninsula and the lands of Egypt, in the strait known nowadays as the Persian Gulf. The Nibiruans brought with them the laws of Nibiru. However, these were based around a monarchical system of government. By luring the Nibiruans to Ki, the master plan of Alalu was twofold. He planned to decrease the Nibiruans' lifespan by forcing them to migrate to the hotter climate of the equatorial regions and there to force their whole species into extinction by crossbreeding with the Cro-Magnons, survivors of the yucatan em pole alignment that had merged the negative south polar Australopithecines with the less evolved Paranthropus species. To Ki came Anu and his sons Enki and Enlil. Enki, Anu promised rulership over Kingyu and the frozen lands to the south, North America still then buried by glaciers. To Enlil, Anu promised rulership over the Anzu Nile region of Ki. Africa. It was at this time that they carved the headstone, originally with an Australopithecine face, that would later be given the brick body of the Sphinx. The face of the headstone was that of Alalu, who was killed by Anu. It was not long until Enki had gotten the mining of monoatomic gold from the glaciers over North America and Greenland up and running and this gold was sent to Antarctica, where it was rendered into its utmost rarefied form and hurled aloft in attempts to seal the breach in the ionosphere, which the Nibiruans believed was responsible for Antarctica's increased cooling. Meanwhile, Enlil established rule in Africa, and their mutual half-sister, Ninti, was established in Vedic Larsha, in Himalayan Tibet. Thus the gods began agriculture in North Africa, South America, and India. Between India and North Africa, Marduk, the son of Enki and Ninti, was given the region called Shumer, i.e. Sumeria. So the twin kings, their sister queen, and the crown prince reigned over the continents of the equatorial world and all under the rule of Anu from Nibiru in positive North Antarctica. So for 2,000 years there reigned ten kings from seven places. The ten kings were the generations of An from his regnal appointment over northern Nibiru and his founding of its capital Agade following through the seven unto Alalu and Anu, the eighth of Enki and Enlil, and the ninth of Marduk, in the reign of the tenth king, whose name is recorded as Zayasudra. So it is written, The flood swept over. The seven places were simply the seven continents, all of which had by then formed and separated and were more or less in the same positions at which they are today. Although at this time, India was still part of Oceania, and there was a land bridge formed by India between Australia and Southeast Asia. So, for 2,000 years, the rule of Nibiru, Oceania, over Africa, India, and South America, continued uninterrupted by warfare or lawlessness. T. 
Ten kings reigned from seven places during these 2,000 years, from negative 1,600 to negative 1,400 year Pythagoras. Ten kings reigned, and then the deluge swept over. What was this flood, this deluge? It was the flood of Zayasudra, long before the flood of Noah even before the flood of Utnapishtim. The flood of Zayasudra occurred in negative 1400 year Pythagoras. The flood of Utnapishtim, which we shall describe soon, occurred in negative 10,000 year Pythagoras. The flood of Noah occurred in negative 4000 year Pythagoras, and we shall come to it soon enough as well. For now, let us explain what the flood of Zayasudra was and what brought it about. For 2,000 years, from negative 1600 to negative 1400 year Pythagoras, the northern Nibiruans of Oceania ruled by monarchical governorship over North Africa, India, and South America. They harvested monoatomic platinum from the glaciers over North America. Then, in negative 1400 year Pythagoras, there was a catastrophe. The EM poles of Earth reversed, positive, negative, and north, south, just as they had twice before, since the asteroid struck and parted Pangaea, the world continent. It was as the negative south hemisphere Australopithecines had feared. The EM poles reversed, and there was a crust shift. The primary results of the EM polarity reversing was simply for the northern lights to end over Antarctica and begin over the Arctic Circle, where the positive north EM pole was then located. The primary results of the crust shift were much more catastrophic, despite that the actual amount of crustal displacement was minimal. In Oceania, around Antarctica, there were massive earthquakes. In North America and Greenland, the glaciers immediately began to break apart and fell off in vast sheets into the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. The result was that the salinization of the transatlantic and Pacific currents dropped by a sufficient amount to induce a freshwater temperature drop in ocean levels worldwide. As the icebergs continued to break off, the Nibiruans in Oceania and Antarctica and the Anunnaki in South America, North Africa, and India, reeling from the aftershocks of earthquakes, realized this trend was not temporary. Nibiru, they realized, only too late, was doomed. Its ultimate fate would be determined not by the hole in the ionosphere in the sky above Agade, but by the relentless frigid, freshwater tsunamis that plagued the islands whenever an ice sheet dislodged from North America. The resultant weather was also massively catastrophic to the Australopithecines of Oceania and the equatorial regions. South America became an overgrown tropical rainforest, as it had been when, millennia before, the Ardipithecus had built the Bimini Road there producing a cornucopia of natural drugs. North Africa, previously a fertile savanna, began becoming an inhospitable desert. India was, by then, joined to Asia. However, the remainder of its constellation of islands, connecting it to Australia and New Zealand, quickly sank underwater as the North American icebergs melted into the ocean and raised sea levels worldwide. The Beringian Land Bridge, connecting Northeast Asia to Northwest America, disappeared, as did the land bridges connecting Antarctica to South Africa and South America. It seemed as though, as soon as the Australopithecines from then negative South Antarctica had begun to migrate away from their doomed homeland 
into more equatorial regions, the catastrophe their ancestors feared so greatly, but which no Nibiruan did once ever even suspect, befell their beautiful country. So ended the period known as the Law of the Twins, when rule by law was brought south from northerly Nibiru. So, by the world flood, do the reigns of ten kings in seven places come to an end at long last. So do the epic of Atlantis and Antarctica come to an end. Chapter 5, The Fifth Eon From negative 14,000 year Pythagoras until negative 12,000 year Pythagoras. The Anunnaki in South America, North Africa, India, and Sumeria did not know that their home, Nibiru, land in the north, had been destroyed. In fact, beginning with the cataclysmic end of the last northern ice age and the catastrophic EM pole reversal and crust shift, the gods had been at war against each other. Marduk and Enki were plotting against Enlil, and Ninti was helplessly caught in the middle. Enki it was who had saved Zayasudra, according at least to the Book of Enki. Ultimately, the result of Zayasudra's being saved was relatively insignificant. In fact, only a little more than half of all those alive in the positive north perished when the poles reversed positive-negative and their homes suddenly became the negative south EM pole. Those who'd survived in the previously north hemisphere, now the south, evolved to become a great seafaring culture who settled the coastlines of all the continents. This global coastal civilization of survivors of the Antarctic Atlantean cataclysms, i.e. the world flood at the end of the last ice age, comprised a culturally unified civilization of masons and were called the Lemurians. They carved heads everywhere they went and raised the earliest massive stone monuments of the present era. On Easter Island, they erected hundreds of massive stone head statues to honor the fall of Atlantis in Antarctica. In England, they erected Stonehenge. In mainland Europe, the Mineheers. In Peru, the Gate of Viracocha. In Brazil, the African-faced heads of the Olmecs. In China, Caral and Merubeka. They built pyramids that dwarfed the later pyramid of Cheops. They taught this skill to their craftsmen, however few understood it well enough to carry it on into the modern era. The reason for the difficulty in passing along this craft is explained in the oversimplified allegory of the giants. According to a theosophical mistranslation of the Old Testament, in the era of the patriarch Enoch, there were giants who walked the earth, and it was, therefore, they who so effortlessly raised the earliest massive stone monuments. However, this is, of course, only a mistranslation, and should not be taken so literally. In fact, the Nephilim of the biblical story refer to the children of the Anunnaki, sons of light, with the wives of men, or more plainly, the interbreeding of the south-north migrating Australopithecines with the north-south migrating Cro-Magnon. Therefore, what we know of this period from comparing these relative sources is that the Nephilim are referred to by the race of Clovis people, that is, those seafaring coast dwellers, the Lemurians, who'd survived the world flood and destruction of Atlantis in Antarctica. 
From this eon, we can date the earliest evidence of cohabitation in a single location, simultaneously, of Cro-Magnon and Australopithecine, in what is modern-day Israel or Palestine. From this cohabitation between the Australopithecines, traveling south from North Antarctica, and the Cro-Magnons, traveling north from the South Polar Arctic Circle, we know these two proto-human cultures exchanged ideas and shared values, such as the belief in the afterlife, and that the Australopithecines instructed the Cro-Magnons in elaborate burial rituals for their dead. It is thus from this eon we can also date the origin for the myth of Adam and Eve. Adam, here, obviously represents the Antarctic Australopithecine Atlanteans, while the Homo erectus, themselves a degeneration of Australopithecines with Paranthropus, were the race of Eve. They had, we are told by scripture, three sons, representing three offspring races to have evolved from their crossbreeding. The first was named Abel. Abel represents the Neanderthal species. The second was named Cain. Cain represents the Cro-Magnon, Clovis people. The third son was named Seth. Seth represents modern Homo sapiens. It was the destruction of Atlantis in Antarctica, from which Enki supposedly saved Zayasudra. However, it was before the reign of Adapa, following the flood, that Utnapishtim appears in the regnal lists of Kish, capital of northern Acadia, and Ur, capital of southern Sumeria, between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. The reason for this is simple. The Utnapishtim, who ruled Acadia from Kish in negative 10,000 year Pythagoras, ruled after the first Adamic prototype, the Australopithecine Anunnaki, but before the first Homo sapien priest king, to whom they granted kingship in around negative 6,000 year Pythagoras, following the flood of Noah in Mesopotamia. All these things were forecast by soothsayers during these tumultuous times of trial for the Clovis people. The skilled craftsmen of those few remaining Australopithecines in the negative South Hemisphere, the negative South Australopithecines, survivors of the world flood and destruction of Atlantis, who were reorganized as Lemurians, into a global coastal trade-based culture, taught the Clovis people all the arts and sciences. So it is said, the sons of light came down unto the daughters of men. The Nephilim, among the Anunnaki, bred with the Clovis people, just as the Anunnaki Nibiruans had bred with the Cro-Magnons to sire the Clovis people to begin with. The last of the remaining Australopithecines to have survived the cataclysms that first sank and then froze Antarctica, who had reformed as the Lemurian Nephilim, and who took as their slaves the Clovis people, and who with them erected stone monuments worldwide, were those whose extremely long skulls we find in Peru, near the Nazca Lines, and depicted in early Egyptian art. They are also the blue-skinned race, described in the Bhagavad Gita as being the Vedic Aryans who delivered the Hindu caste system in the Rig Vedas. At this time, from negative 14,000 to negative 12,000 year Pythagoras, the monarchical rule of Nibiru over Oceania ended the Anunnaki rulers of the equatorial regions were pit against one another, and the Nephilim Lemurians were grown widespread. 
It is the beginning of the age in which the Neanderthals, Clovis, and Homo sapien species will be born. Atlantis has only just been destroyed. The monarchy of Nibiru, among the remaining Anunnaki, remains dispersed. There is much that remains, even to the gods on earth at this time, unknown. The Anunnaki do not yet know that Nibiru has been destroyed. The Nephilim have not yet had relations with the daughters of men. This is the era called in the records of our order the Aeon of No Law. Some have speculated it was necessary for all that had been achieved to be destroyed in order for the great work, then complete, to be swept away so that, from scratch, it may begin again. Chapter 1 The Sixth Aeon From negative 12,000 year Pythagoras until negative 10,000 year Pythagoras North America, ruled by Enki. Following the dissolution of the glaciers covering North America, Enki was awarded rule over this land. While he granted rulership over his former domain, South America, to his first son, as described next. Enki having allegedly saved Zayasudra from the flood, established his son as Viracocha in the Peruvian mythologies. Among the descendants of the once great Mayan empire, it is common knowledge that Zayasudra, last king of Nibiru, before kingship was lowered to Kish, was none other than Pakalvotan, entombed in Palank. The most common name for Zayasudra who has also been called Quetzalcoatl or Kukulcan, the plumed serpent, and from thence also Sargon, Gilgamesh, Moses, Mithra, Messiah, Christos, Krishna, and Zoroaster, all names whose essential meaning is saved from water, is Enoch, although his real name was Enos. He was the prince of the capital city of Agade in Nibiru, called Enoch of Atlantis. It was said of Zayasudra he was saved from the flood before Adapa reigned in Kish. Thus, Zayasudra was an Australopithecine from Nibiru, although his myth, by the time of the birth of Noah to Homo sapien parents, only associated him with the Nephilim Lemurian masters of the Clovis people. South America, ruled by Inki's first son, Ningish Zida, Thoth. Ningish Zida was the Sumerian epithet given to Zayasudra, first son of Enki. At first, while Enki ruled in South America and was extracting monoatomic gold from ice core samples in glaciated North America, and North Africa was governed by Enlil, and Nibiru and Australopithecines mined monoatomic gold from volcanic mines there, and Vedic India was ruled from Aryan Larsha by Ninti, their sister wife, and Anu yet lived in Nibiru. Ningish Zitta was born in India to Ninti. He was a full-blood Australopithecine, but his lineage was disputed. Was Inki or Enlil his father? Anu asked Ninti. She could not tell him. So, at first, Zayasudra was made ruler of North Africa and the volcanic gold mining there. He proved his worth while managing this expedition by increasing productivity, by creating a helpmate for the Australopithecine workers in the North African mines. The helpmate he proposed was to be a mixture of the Australopithecines in North Africa and the Cro-Magnons, discovered in modern Israel, Palestine, by Alalu. 
The result of his suggestion were the three species, Neanderthal, Clovis, and Homo sapien. For this achievement, he was rewarded command of South America when Inky, his father, took over North America. North Africa, ruled by first Ningish Zitta, then Marduk. Now, while Ningish Zitta was reigning the empire of Nibiru from North Africa in the Abzu region, a second son was born to Ninti. Again, Anu questioned her who the father was, whether it was Inki or Enlil. This time, her answer was ready. Marduk, the son of Enki, was. And this complicated things, because while Enki had already promoted Ningish Zitta of North Africa, Zayasudra of Nibiru, as Thoth over South America, as if he were Enki's own son, now Marduk was clearly Enki's heir, and yet Thoth had already held all the possible relevant titles to which Marduk was the rightful claimant. It was for this reason that warfare broke out in the equatorial regions of the Anunnaki gods between Marduk, the legal son and rightful heir of Enki, and Thoth, Enki's adoptive and most favored son. Enki cautioned Marduk that one day Marduk would reign over Kingyu and all of Ki, South America, and all Africa. But that his time had not yet come. This only inflamed Marduk more, who built up his population and waged war against Thoth in North Africa. Marduk's stronghold of Sumero Acadia he unified into the empire of Babel. All of this was before the flood of Noah, the great-grandson of Enoch, Thoth the Australopithecine with a Clovis woman, in negative 4,000 year Pythagoras. The exact dates of the events involving the regions of the Middle East, Mesopotamia, and North Africa are unclear, however, because much of the record of these events was destroyed in the flood of Noah. There remains speculation if the flood of Noah was not brought about to punish Marduk for raising an army against Thoth. In either event, Marduk eventually did capture North Africa from Thoth, and Thoth did retreat to South America. Sumeria ruled by Marduk. Because at the time of Marduk's recognition by Ninti to Anu as Inki's legal heir, Thoth, whom Marduk saw as a usurper to his rightful thrones, was already stationed in North Africa. Marduk was given the region of Sumeria in Mesopotamia between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. We know from archaeological evidence that the flood of Noah swept over this region in around negative 4,000 year Pythagoras. The flood of Noah is also thus called the Mesopotamian flood. It is not clear if the purpose of this flood was, as Enki claims and Leo wished, to exterminate all the hybrid species of Australopithecines and Cro-Magnons, Neanderthals, Clovis, and Homo sapien, or if the flood was sent to punish Marduk for his leading an army against Ningish Zidda and against Ninurta, Enlil's son, who sided with Ningish Zidda against Marduk. According to some theories, the destruction of the cities of the gods that followed the destruction of Mesopotamia by the flood in around negative 4,000 year Pythagoras was caused by the war between Marduk and the other gods. The destruction, according to these theories, 
occurred when the gods used weapons of mass destruction against Marduk's throne city, Babylon. But their plan backfired when an unexpected change of the wind carried the death cloud they'd created back upon their own cities and destroyed all of them instead. There is no way to confirm the use of weapons of mass destruction by the gods in the battle against Marduk following the flood of Noah that had swept over Mesopotamia. It is known, however, that the technologies applied by Thoth that Marduk had acquired when he conquered North Africa. He had definitely learned to apply to building up and fortifying his chief city, Babylon. At the time of the destruction of the other cities of the gods and the fall of the Tower of Babel, when Abraham left Ur and Lot left Sodom, it is clear that this technology was also smuggled out of Babylon when it was nearly destroyed and transported back to North Africa again was used to build the earliest pyramids of the Old Kingdom there. Soon enough, Enki and his two sons had, by making enemies of one another, completely divided the kingdom of the Anunnaki against itself, and, moreover, shifted all the ruling power over to Enki's line, depriving Enlil and Ninurta of rightful rule over any territory, for Marduk made it clear that any territory Ninurta might try to claim as his own, Marduk would contest such with violence and win. Such was the law of Marduk, and so such was the law of Lemuria. Two things, however, must be recognized of the laws from this era. The first and most primary law was called the Law of One. According to the Law of One, the priest kings, who went before their gods on behalf of their generation of people, were all recorded in the histories as being the same being, that is, the entity of their god. Therefore, the earliest records we have of the era of rule by Marduk begin with Sargon unifying South and North Egypt, and thus establishing the rule of the war god Marduk over North Africa. At that time, his law was codified as Lex Talionis by Hammurabi. The aeon during which Marduk reigns as god-king has not even yet ended, although the original being named Marduk, an Australopithecine who lived before the birth of the Homo sapien species, died long ago. The secondary law was the actual law of Lemuria at this time, and it, like the Lex Talionis of Marduk in Western civilization, has continued to this day as well. It is the law of no law, called by some individual sovereignty, whereby no individual can control any other individual, and ultimately every individual is responsible for themselves and their own choices. The law of Marduk the last Lemurians of today called Babylon, and the law of personal sovereignty they call Zion. However, the fact remains that, within the borders of the empire of civilization, Marduk is the lone god, and that, for the citizens of this empire, their lives could not be further from the idea of this centralized rule. Chapter 2 the seventh aeon, from negative 10,000 year Pythagoras until negative 8,000 year Pythagoras. As the seventh aeon began, the last Australopithecines of Antarctica were migrating north through South Africa, Australia, and South America. In South America, they were the people whose skulls are preserved to this day as being much longer in cranial cavity capacity than the Homo sapiens of today. In Australia, they bred with Clovis people to become the aboriginal races that remain there today, then migrated into India to establish the Vedic caste system, interbreeding there with Homo sapiens, then into Siberia 
by which time they were mostly interbred with Homo sapiens, and finally North Europe as a purely Homo sapien tradition. In Africa, they built the great pyramids of the Old and Early Middle Kingdom in Egypt, but were, according to the remaining traditions, already extinct in this region before the Mesopotamian flood of negative 4,000 year Pythagoras. By the end of this eon, they would also be extinct in South America and the Middle East, and completely interbred with Homo sapiens and Clovis throughout the rest of the world. It is from this species that the RH negative gene comes down to us in many humans. Only those Homo sapiens bred with Clovis, or those Homo sapiens who are pure and non-interbred, have the RH positive gene, while those who bred with the Australopithecines are RH negative. Because the RH positive cancels the RH negative out, but the RH negative only negates the RH positive over many generations. This blood type is A, rare, and B, indicative of an earlier species, the Australopithecines, evolved from the rhesus monkey, that was unique on our family tree from the Cro-Magnon interbred Clovis and Homo sapiens species. As the seventh aeon began, the rule of Marduk was preeminent over North Africa and the Middle East. The rule of Thoth as Viracocha, Pakalvotan, Quetzalcoatl, Kukulkan, and as Tezcatlipoca, was likewise established in South America. In North Africa and South America, pyramids began to be built to honor these sun gods. Marduk, the sun, and Thoth, the moon. In Eastern Asia and North America, the generations of their gods were over. Enki, Enlil, and Ninurta, called Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, in India, had abandoned them. And so, ultimately, they became answerable to the rule of Marduk, that is, Krishna, the child of Shiva and Brahma, representing the new eon. By the time the law of Marduk reached Russia, it was already called Orthodox Christianity, and the Russians themselves, the Homo sapien offspring of the last northward migrating Australopithecines with the Clovis. At this time, the time of the seventh aeon for which our order records history, the Clovis inhabited Russia and North America, and the Australopithecines of India had only just begun to migrate north from East Asia into Russia in North Asia. The Clovis, by the end of this aeon, inhabited North Europe, North America, and North Asia. Homo sapiens inhabited North Africa and Mesopotamia, and Neanderthal were extinct. However, at the beginning of this, the seventh aeon, Australopithecines flourished in Africa and Mesopotamia, South America, and India, and have just entered Australia, South Africa, and South America in a second wave of immigration away from Antarctica, which was, finally, by this point, abandoned and beginning to glaciate. Such was the flood of Utnapishtim, just as Zayasudra, that is, Thoth, was the son of Enki, saved from the first destruction of Nibiru, so too, from the final destruction of Antarctica, came a second flood of Australopithecines into the equatorial regions, originally settled by their forefathers. And just as the first wave of Anunnaki Australopithecines bred with Cro-Magnons to beget Clovis, Neanderthal, and Homo sapiens, so too did this second wave of Nephilim Australopithecines 
breed with Clovis and Homo sapiens. During the seventh aeon, the Nephilim Australopithecines interbred with the Clovis of Australia and North Asia, and with the Homo sapiens of North Africa and Mesopotamia. The Anunnaki Australopithecines, who ruled in North Africa, South America, South Asia, and Mesopotamia realized they were now outnumbered by this wave of Nephilim immigrants and that they could not possibly compete with their interbreeding with the Clovis and Homo sapiens. The Anunnaki Australopithecines had interbred with Cro-Magnons to produce Clovis and Homo sapiens, but had only bred with them in their own regions. Thus, they bred with Homo sapiens in North Africa and Mesopotamia, and with Clovis and Homo sapiens in South Asia. However, although there were Clovis in North America, during the seventh aeon of our order's history, South America appears to have been sparsely populated and almost entirely Anunnaki. It would not be until the extinction of the Australopithecine at the end of the seventh aeon that South America began to be inhabited and then only coastally by the Clovis. By the end of the seventh aeon, Homo sapiens had begun to migrate into South Europe from North Africa and Mesopotamia and into North Asia from Mesopotamia and South Asia. From here, they spread rapidly across the Beringian land bridge, connecting North Asia to North America, and from North America, they would eventually enter South America. However, by that time, the Clovis people of North Europe, North Asia, and North America would all be completely extinct as well. The law of the seventh aeon was called the law of life. No law was codified and the Anunnaki rulers who had preserved the regnal and priestly traditions of Nibiru had already begun to become supplanted by the less advanced, more primitive traditions of their Nephilim brethren, who migrated later following the fall of Nibiru. The earlier Australopithecine Anunnaki passed as many of their traditions on to the Clovis and the Homo sapiens species they had begotten as they could, the Neanderthal species was already being supplanted entirely by the Clovis at this point, and the growth rate of both the Clovis and Homo sapiens was threatening to overwhelm the last remaining populations of Cro-Magnons. Although the earliest Homo sapiens preserved the laws given to them by the Anunnaki, the Clovis only cared for their own empowerment by learning the sciences of the Nephilim. Although Homo sapiens remained loyal to rule by their ancestral gods, the Clovis migrated more rapidly and had already spread into Australia, North America, North Europe, and North Asia by the end of the seventh aeon, while Homo sapiens remained densely populating only Mesopotamia and South Asia. By the end of the seventh aeon, the Homo sapiens began to migrate into North Europe, Africa, Australia, and North Asia, taking with them the monotheism of Marduk.